Hello world, it's time we had one of those talks about days gone by, the kind where I end up using the word whippersnapper at some point. Sadly it's so convoluted that I'm going to have to resort to describing three separate types of games before I even get to the subject of this video, so I hope you enjoy title cards, or at the very least you're not mortally afraid of them. I imagine that's quite a tough life already without me making it worse, so sorry about that. There used to be this wee market for video game adaptations of popular board games. Monopoly, Risk, Clue, Scrabble, I suppose chess might count, that was one of the first uses of computer hardware that could be labelled as a game. It wasn't an enormous market, as I said, but it was big enough to stretch to the console versions I'm showing now. Of course, hobbyist programmers writing their own versions of board games for home computers isn't a big surprise, but with all the licensing hoops that console manufacturers made you jump through in those days, you had to be somewhat dedicated if you wanted a particular adaptation on a console. And despite some companies jumping through said hoops, the market never did get all that large, I think. I don't recall them being advertised on TV or anything. Maybe it's just not the same when there's no board to flip. Speaking of which, nowadays the whole concept has been rendered slightly obsolete by the emergence of Tabletop Simulator. Stick the right assets into that and you can play damn near anything, dubious legality aside. I haven't seen any official Tabletop Simulator versions of board games yet, so I imagine the issue of a copyright will come up, but right now it's about as murky as downloading a ROM for a cartridge you already physically own. Assuming one of the players owns the board game you're all playing, otherwise it's pretty firmly in the plus no camp. Did he quote me in court on this, not a lawyer or anything close to that, behave yourselves. But before the mighty tabletop simulator gave us all the sublime pleasure of setting up a full Game of Thrones board in seconds, and then drawing dicks all over it, there was a tiny market within board games themselves, the video board game. Not a video game, but a board game with a video, which at the time came on this hilariously large plastic contraption. You would set up the board as normal, shove the VHS tape into whichever of your VCRs was working at the time, and it would act as your game clock. Then you might occasionally have a host pop up on screen in order to, in the established board game connoisseur parlance, fuck your shit. I've built up a small collection of these games over the years, it's pretty much the main reason I still have a working VCR in my house. Not that I need to bother, since a video board game of any notoriety will have had its video put up on YouTube or the like. Just double check that the enterprising fellow madam or otherwise in question didn't decide to put any mid-roll ads on. Considering how niche and short-lived this genre was to begin with, you might be surprised to find names like Star Trek and Star Wars with their own video board games. Some of them use the video as an enhancement of an otherwise good board game instead of relying on the gimmick to sell, and some of them did the other thing. But the one that started it all, whether it by being the first or merely the first to get big, was Atmosphere. Never heard of it? Well you might have actually, because it was only called Atmosphere in the UK, everywhere else called it Nightmare, including its country of origin, Australia. Best guess there was a trademark problem with the kids TV show Nightmare, despite one being spelt with a K and one not. Trademark law can be weird from what I gather, not a lawyer, blah blah blah. Thing is, first doesn't necessarily mean best, and Atmosphere isn't something you could call a good board game. You yeah, might get a kick out of it on your first playthrough, and even then you probably had to play it when it was new, but a VHS tape doesn't randomise, you'll get the same host doing the same things every time. Ironically, you'll spend the rest of the game praying to the random number gods because you might as well roll a die at the beginning to see who wins. Anyways, like I said, not the best, there's better reviews of this game out there already, and besides, each atmosphere release is a little bit different from the last, that being all three expansions and what I suppose you could call a sequel in the form of the Harbingers. Today's subject, Atmosphere the Third Dimension, does not prove to be an exception to this type of iteration. But what else could you expect from a video game based on a video board game? See, that's why I had to do all the explaining bits, totally necessary. I can see the logic here though. Board games have a set up time that some people can't be bothered with and VHS tapes are limited to the same hosting experience every time. A video game does all that for you and the power of the CD-ROM can introduce a random element, make it fresh each time. Like any sane person is going to play this more than once. How about another game? Double or nothing, you dirty rotten shit! Fancy another game? What are you, m masochistic? Although the game does advertise itself as having non-stop monitor melting replayability, where each game experience is diabolically different. I can't help but feel that monitor melting and replayability are mutually exclusive. It does have SVGA graphics though, I've always had a soft spot for those. 
then again, that's the same logic that got me to play the Orion Conspiracy. And I really don't mean to keep doing this, but we're back to Windows 3.1 again, and we're back so hard that I couldn't get this running on my usual DOS box setup. Mind you, this is regular Windows 3.1, running on a simulated DOS environment under Windows 10. Why am I even surprised that there's been a hiccup? Eventually I had to resort to a pre-made installer that some very nice person put together, and that ran it fine. Wouldn't be the first time I've had multiple DOS box installs on one system, I do buy games off GOG after all. Now just before we start, I'd like to point out this wee sheet of paper you get with the game which says, before you do anything else, read this! I mean it must be important if it warrants three exclamation marks, that's how those work. They're really keen for you to play this with other people apparently, and suggest getting food and drinks in before you start. Now they don't mention alcohol specifically, Actually, yeah, I think that's all I need to say on that one. Also, they tell you to play the included audio CD on your Hi-Fi or Ghetto Blaster. Not, you know, the PC you already have, which has a CD-ROM drive. I suppose if you only require two-speed CD-ROM drive, streaming data and audio at once is asking a bit much. On to the show at long bloody last. We start this thing up and get an animated logo with a voiceover, if you're lucky. Bear in mind that there was still a lot of standardisation left to do when it came to making graphics and audio happen on a PC. I mean, DirectX wasn't even a thing yet. So these types of games were hard enough to get running when they were new. Anyway, Spoopy Host does a heckin' big spoop on you to set the tone for the rest of the game. By big I mean barely animated grainy mush, and by tone I mean ham. That tone isn't a million miles away from the original board game granted, maybe a little more crazy as opposed to angry in this instance, and I think it's actually the same guy who first played the gatekeeper in the video board game video, so points for that. Has anyone ever figured out what his accent is? I've never heard anyone elongate their terminal ER noises in such a way that they need mile markers. It's how I imagine everyone in Barovia speaks. Get used to this view of the gatekeeper by the way, the same close up of his eyes with different voiceovers on top. Oh no, beg your pardon, one of three close ups of his eyes with different voiceovers on top. Hard to tell if that was to save space on the CD or to avoid whatever horrendous process it took to get video tape onto a computer in those days, but I miss seeing that mucky grump fuck. After your obligatory beration, you're plunged into the new game process, which is definitely a new game process. First, you need to pick the number of players. Obviously, this means that multiplayer will be done via hot seat. One player takes their turn, gets up, next player sits down. And while I could criticise this for not having network play, remember how difficult I said it was to get moving pictures and sound under Windows 3.1? Yeah, I would not try and program networking on top of that either. You'll get a pass on that one. Next, all the players get randomly assigned a character, and since I like hearing things said in lists, here's all the characters. Khufu, the cheapest Halloween costume. Baron Samadhi, the badly aging hat choice. Countess Elizabeth Bathory, the orthodontist fetish. Anne de Chantrain, the only creature with a nose bigger than mine. Helen, the creepiest reason I'll never have kids. And Gavodin, the man pupper. Given that playing a certain character might benefit a certain playing style, more on that later, it's questionable whether you should be allowed to pick or not, so I'll let this slide too. Hashtag Team Samity. This point is also where the most obnoxious line of the game lives, and depending on how many players you tend to pick, chances are you'll hear it more than once. Kufu. The mommy! Next, pick your greatest fear. Yeah, you have to pick from a set of six fears instead of writing down your own like you do in the board game, and you'll see why when we've reached the end. After this, if you've chosen a one player game, you set the temperature? Apparently this is how the game represents difficulty, which manifests in various complex ways that this manual page can explain better than I can. If you want a practice mode that gives you everything you need right at the start, set it as low as it'll go. Then you can head for the exit whenever you want. Finally, you set how long the game will last for and how long each player's turn will last. That second one might be especially useful in the board game version, given the eons it can take for any one person to fiddle through their time cards looking for something usable and throwing out all the hundred odd cards that have already expired. Except time cards don't exist in this version, presumably because the hot seat nature of the multiplayer would absolutely ruin that, and also because they weren't all that good to begin with. Kinda pointless me bringing it up really. Oh, and to make the point clear, they really do make you set up a new game like this, one step at a time. Could have put it all on one sole spoopy screen, maybe have the background be a gravestone, but no. Maybe they knew people would only try this once, so there's not much point in making a setup quick and easy in that case. And with all that done, we finally start playing the game at long last- oh no. Oh no. 
I could more or less sum this entire review up in 15 seconds. Question, have you ever wanted to play a board game from the perspective of your playing piece? Signed, a couple of cowboys, makers of atmosphere slash nightmare. Answer, holy goddamn no, signed literally everyone. Your main view is from where your piece is on the board. Facing forward, no change of the camera apart from the directions your piece can move. So, two to four choices. Which might be acceptable if there were smooth animations when moving between the spaces. There are no smooth animations when moving between the spaces. This is the default, that's how you're meant to spend the majority of your time, being able to see almost nothing of use. They weren't completely sadistic though, you do have a map view that you can switch to looking at. You can't move while it's open, but you can look. And thus every one of your turns is going to be some variation of rolling the die, checking the map, moving to a junction, checking the map, turning around, moving a bit and checking the map. Lords help you if the turn time was set any lower than 20 seconds, because that is violence waiting to happen. It gets worse when you realise that's why the game has the subtitle The Third Dimension, because this counted as 3D at the time. Sorry, I meant to say eye-popping 3D SVGA graphics to depict the game's multiple drop-dead dazzling environments. I have to be honest, the second I discovered that this is how the majority of the game is played was the same second I decided I was going to review it. Someday, this has actually been on my shelf for a while. I haven't even described how you play the game, that's how significant this point is to me. As good a segue as any though, let's talk gameplay. The game area is split into provinces, each the realm of one of these characters you get randomly assigned and can't choose, and you start in your own character's province. Your goal is to travel the provinces, get a coloured key from each by landing exactly on the right space, and then make your way to the casket and face your greatest fear. Which means opening the casket and seeing if it shows you the fear you picked at the start. Now, depending on which edition of the board game you're playing, the win condition could be picking your fear out of the casket or picking someone else's. Given that this game follows the Harbingers edition of the board game most closely, it's no surprise that both that and this require you to pick a fear which isn't yours. And here's where we see why you have a predetermined list of fears to pick from, because otherwise they couldn't show you these deliciously 90s FMVs of said fears playing out. But you need all the keys first. The first key you need to pick up is the one from your own starting province. That gives you the ability to enter the tunnels and visit the other provinces. From there, each colour key will grant you a different power depending on which character you're playing. This is what I meant when I said your character might affect your playstyle. Who you get determines where you start and how far you'll have to go to reach the keystone you really want. Because some of these powers give you more of an advantage than others, aside from the obvious let you leave the starting area power. That one kind of speaks for itself. So let's do another list. Never ban- oh sorry, these are all in capitals. NEVER BANISHED! This one releases you from the black hole if you are banished. The black hole is a place you can be sent as a punishment or just at the random will of the host. Whilst in the black hole, you'll skip your turns until you're released. I'd say skip, it plays this animation on your turn instead. Which is fun as hell if all the players are banished and you get an endless cycle of character portraits and swirlies. I was being quite literal with my definition of fun as hell there. To be clear, if you have this key, you will still be sent to the black hole space if you're banished, but you can then walk straight back out of it again. So it's more like banished lol joking. DUEL! I'll explain exactly what duels are later, but this particular key gives you a 25% bonus when you're attacking in a duel. DEFENSE! Same as before, but the 25 bonus is given when you're defending in a duel. Stop on any stone. I know it doesn't sound very dramatic, but normally you're forced to move your entire dice roll, despite the need to end your turn on stones to get their benefits. This key lets you stop wherever you want, even if you still have movement left. FLIGHT! Sadly not quite as self-explanatory as you'd hope, this lets you fly from one province to another. No tunnels and no endless rolling of die. Okay, you still need to get to the centre headstone first, but it still saves you a lot of time. Now, as I said, each of the coloured keys has a different ability depending on your character. Thankfully, the game comes with these six quick reference card leaflet things, which tell you exactly what colour key will do for what character. They also contain a map of the provinces, showing where all the key, fate and fortune spaces are. Would have helped if the icons weren't black against dark backgrounds, but never mind. So I have a couple of more things to explain, namely those fate and fortune spaces, as well as dueling. Ending your turn on a fortune space will give you a benefit like power points or a free turn, whereas a fate space will generally just mess with you. Landing on either of these spaces will throw up a variety of different screens, ranging from picking a door to open to playing blackjack for no clearly established reason. But what's the benefit of these power points you might ask, and quite reasonably so? Duels is the- sorry, 
duel is the answer. Come your turn, you can start a barmy with any of the other players. How this works is you'll essentially bet a percentage of your power points against your opponent doing the same. If you end up betting more points, you win. Of course, you can only bet as many power points as you have, hence why collecting them is in any way useful. The winner is then faced with a choice. Take a key from their opponent or curse them. Once again, the nature of this curse depends on the victorious character. For example, being cursed by Anne de Chantrain turns you into a toad, reducing your movement speed to 1. Handy if you're right next to the square you want to land on, but otherwise utterly infuriating. So that's a fun thing to look for while trying to hoover up keys and escape this this very bad, odd land world place. They're, they're never clear about it. In fact, if you're playing with AI opponents, you'd better get used to that, because you'll soon realise that the AI is programmed to do nothing else but wait for you to pick up keys and then duel you for them. Which, to go back to curses for a moment, becomes hilarious if you're playing as Elizabeth Bathory the Vampire. If you curse another player as her, that player has to give any keys they receive to you instead, including any keys they just dueled you for. Vampire's curse is working its magic. You gladly give her your heart. And that key. And they don't learn their lesson either. I had one game where I was playing key pong for about five rounds in a row. And that's the game essentially. You go on a hunt for brightly coloured keys, and while foraging, you ferociously fend off fiendish phantom fuckery from both the other players and the gatekeeper, who essentially pops in every once in a while to check if you're too happy. I know why you never crack a smile. You would crack mirrors. Sounds simple enough, but once again, you're looking at your playing piece's point of view, a 90 degree angle facing forwards. You'll only be able to see the next junction, and that's if you're lucky. I get the benefit of having this experience in video game form. You don't have to remember what character's cursed as what, or who picked what fear, or if that one character can actually do the thing he says this key lets him do despite not letting you look at his card. It's all done for you. But this first person malarkey comes close to completely killing it for me. I'm struggling to think of a worse way you could have presented it. Interpretive dance? I don't know. It's best played as a novelty party game anyway, where a love of nuanced and balanced rule sets gives way to advanced states of inebriation. Or if you're not a drinker by age or choice, being distracted by a bee or a weirdly shaped lamp. Hell, maybe even both. But for me, it suffers the same problem that the Harbingers did. The gatekeeper is much more functional. He doesn't take his time screwing with you like he did before. He shows up, says his piece, then vanishes. It feels far more like the rules fairy dropping in every once in a while as opposed to a constant menacing presence. Which wears off after about two playthroughs anyway, since it's always the same events in the same order on VHS. The biggest advantage to this version is easily the random nature of the gatekeeper as opposed to the VHS restricted linearity of the original board games. And a couple of cowboys apparently agreed, because after a lengthy hiatus, they ended up making some DVD-based atmosphere board games, which look worse than the originals. I'm starting to think green screen and CGI were bad inventions, folks. There were only two of these, released in 2004 and 2006, so not quite the rebirth some people hoped for. Which, perhaps contrary to everything I've said so far, I think is a shame. Whether it's because I applaud the attempt at shaking up the board game formula, or because I was seven years old when the first game came out and it fits right into my nostalgia bubble, I would not have minded more attempts at this. If they pulled the personality of the first game's host with the tighter rules of the Harbingers, that would have been ideal. For now, I'll hold on to my collection of big dusty boxes like the grumpy curmudgeon that I am. I can only hope that an important lesson was learned from this. Nobody wants to see anything from the perspective of a playing piece. And just to bring this whole review full circle, you can now play Atmosphere in Tabletop Simulator, video and all, for as long as there's a copy up on YouTube. Viva la revolution, long live the new flesh, etc. My game. By my rules. I am the gatekeeper. I rule this game.